Okay, welcome everyone to uh, our Volunteer Drivers Program Insurance and Liability Issue webinar. I'm Heather Edmonds with the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center. And we would like to welcome you to part two of our workshop on volunteer driver insurance. Today's webinar will focus on liability and protection. Um, if you are unable to participate in part one of this workshop, the webinar recording and presentation is on our website, which is www.nadtc.org and um, under training and webinars. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few logistics. Participants will be in listen only mode during the presentation. The webinar is being recorded and will be sent via email along with slides and will also be posted to our website. Closed captioning is available today. Um, if you need to enable that option, please go to the bottom right of the screen, click the CC button and that option will be available to you. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of this presentation, there will be a facilitated discussion and um, Q&A session. And now I'd like to turn things over to Virginia Dyes, co-director for the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center, and she would introduce our speakers for today. Thanks very much, Heather. Welcome everyone. We're really so pleased to have you with us this afternoon. Um, we're looking forward to uh, a couple of really terrific presentations, and then I think some good discussion. So let, let's get right into it. Um, just so you all know, we are uh, you may put questions in the, in the chat box throughout the presentation. There's no problem with your doing that. Um, but uh, we will hold questions until both presentations have been completed. Um, so we have two presenters today. Uh, we'll begin with William Henry, uh, who I think a lot of folks uh, know. Um, he's a consultant with Volunteer Insurance Services Service Association, or VIS, um, which is an organization that provides insurance and risk management um, services to volunteer-based organizations um, in every state in the United States, um, plus the District of Columbia. Um, so we're very pleased to have uh, William with us today to share his considerable expertise. Um, and then he'll be followed by Carrie Diamond, who is our colleague here at NADTC. She is a training and technical assistance specialist. She works at Easter Seals, um, and we don't hold that against her as being part of the NADTC. Um, I've known Carrie for quite a number of years, and she previously worked at the uh, Greater Wisconsin um, Aging Services Association, um, which, which operates uh, and, and the largest area agency on aging in the state of Wisconsin, serving more than 70 uh, counties. Um, and Carrie worked actually throughout the state of Wisconsin with folks who worked on transportation and mobility uh, management issues. Um, so I'm so pleased that she's gonna be able to share some of that experience um, based information with you all today. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it right over uh, to William Henry. So William, take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be with you. Um, VIS has been in operation since the early 70s. We're best known for our program for insuring volunteers. Some of you might know us that way. Uh, we also provide a variety of risk management resources uh, and this is a good example of the participating in this webinar um, to help volunteer-based organizations understand and uh, address their foreseeable risks. My contact information will be on the last slide of my part of the presentation. Happy to get an email or a phone call from you with any questions you have or any assistance that you might need. Uh, we've seen a lot in our nearly 50 years of operations. So we can probably help you with your particular situation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and we can continue on past that one. So much uh, is uh, 
depends on great communication before a volunteer driver even gets behind the wheel. This has to do with making sure that the expectations of your organization and your clients are the same. Are what you expect to deliver the same as what's being expected? Um, that has to do sometimes with uh, communication directly with the client, sometimes with the client's family. Some of the considerations, um, what are the destinations going to be for the client who's being transported? Uh, will it, how often will they need to go there or multiple destinations? Are you going to provide the same driver each time or might it be someone different on a particular visit? Will the client need assistance of any kind, either just holding an arm or maybe assistance with a, a wheelchair or a walker and by the volunteer? Um, you know, if there's a wheelchair involved, you might not want to assign a volunteer who drives a Prius. These are some of the considerations before the services even began. Will the volunteer be asked to stay at the destination or um, can another driver pick up the client for the return trip home? All these are questions that need to be uh, answered in the beginning so that there aren't any surprises once the services begin. Um, is a ride along okay? A family member or a friend who might want to accompany the client? Is it okay to tip the driver? You know, if you're reimbursing the driver for expenses, you might want to let the client know that. It could affect their decision on whether they want to tip the driver. Will the driver, this is very important, will the driver be able to do anything other than transport the client? For example, especially if a good relationship has been established, the client might ask the volunteer to do some tasks around the house whether it's landscaping or light maintenance, whatever it might be. This needs to be discussed before it's agreed to. Uh, there could be some safety issues involved, but also you want your volunteer to have a positive experience. And if they uh, feel obligated to do things that they never signed up for, it could affect their satisfaction with their role. So it's, it all just depends on good communication in the beginning. Next slide, please. All right, so once the transportation services began, uh, first impressions are very important. We suggest that the first time a volunteer meets with the client, uh, he or she makes an introduction. If you have given them credentials to show that they are part of your organization, present those. Um, you should have already discussed the need for assistance with the client, but if not, let the volunteer take care of that and make sure that the, uh, the client is comfortable getting from the door into the vehicle. Um, confirm the destination so that everybody knows where you're supposed to be going. And when they get there, make sure they get inside safely. Conversation is uh, great if the client wants it and the, the volunteer is willing, uh, just don't get into anything personal, no personal matters about health issues, things like that. Next. Uh, we have some resources that I hope you'll take advantage of. Uh, we collaborated with the National Volunteer Transportation Center to develop the first and still the only online volunteer driver safety training course. Your volunteers can take this at their convenience at home uh, in about an hour if they go straight through from the beginning to the end. And when they've completed uh, the course, which consists of testing several modules with multiple choice questions at the end to test the uh, volunteers' knowledge that they gained, once that's completed, a, a certificate can be generated and sent to the volunteer supervisor so that um, you'll know when your volunteers have completed. Um, we, we think it's a great idea to require volunteers to do this because it is a simple and easy safety refresher course. And when you do that, you're demonstrating your due diligence in having volunteers properly trained to drive safely. When you conduct your due diligence, 
it helps address a concern that I know many of you have. I hear it every time I go to a conference, when we used to go to conferences. Every time I have a conversation, uh, and that's the liability word. When you have your drivers tra properly trained and provide them risk management resources, you are reducing your liability. You are demonstrating that you are doing what's appropriate for you to make sure that your operations can be carried out safely for the client and for the volunteer. Um, another resource, this is a partner of ours, Assisted Rides. You might be familiar with them. They are a great organization. They have a web-based platform. Volunteers can see what, what rides are needed. They can sign up for them in real time and you can track all of that activity. Okay, next please. I know that Carrie is going to get into some best practices with driver selection and, and screening. Uh, just to hit it quickly, from my point of view, they need to show you that they have personal auto liability insurance, both initially and also whenever that insurance renews. So for each volunteer, put the renewal date on your calendar so that you'll know to ask them for proof of insurance when it's up for renewal. Uh, initially, the motor vehicle record is a must from our point of view, so that you can make sure that none of your volunteers are disqualified from being able to drive for you. Sterling Volunteers, is another of our partners, provides real-time updates. So if you have a volunteer with a pristine motor vehicle record who gets uh, a DUI, you'll know it. You don't have to wait for next year and to pull that motor vehicle record and see it then. If your state requires vehicle safety inspection, that's another due diligence touchstone. Uh, put it on your calendar uh, every year, make them show you that they, their vehicle was deemed to be safe to drive. Now you may also choose to apply some other tests. You don't want to do so much that you're not gonna have any willing volunteers, but some of the things that you might consider are drug screens, uh, criminal background checks, especially I know most of you are, have clients who are elderly, perhaps vulnerable to being taken advantage of. You could choose to have a criminal background uh, test. First aid, CPR, all these are possibilities. Risk management is no one thing. It's the appropriate combination of things that's practical and appropriate for you that you can do to reduce the risk that something bad will happen. Okay, next. I mentioned Sterling Volunteers, that's their website. Um, if you are a member of Viz, you can enjoy a discount on their services. One of the handouts that's available to you for this session is what we call the Motor Vehicle Acceptability Checklist. You look at what a driver, um, a driver's motor vehicle record will, how do you evaluate that objectively? This checklist will allow you to do that. If you are a VIZ member, it's there for you uh, 24 seven in what we call our VIZ vault. Or you can contact me and I'll be happy to email it to you. All right, next. I guess many of you have volunteer drivers who are older and it's, you always want to make certain that they're still able to drive safely. They could be 95 and a very safe driver. They could be 65 and beginning to show some uh, capacity issues. So it's, um, it's something that needs to be monitored. It's a good reason for the volunteer supervisor just to ride along occasionally, if that's a possibility for you with the volunteer driver and observe. Sometimes if you see indications of some problems, some cognitive issues maybe, or mobility issues that are affecting the driver, you might be able to talk with family members, their adult children with them uh, and see what their experience has been. And if you feel that it's necessary to ease that volunteer out of that role, sometimes a family member can help with that. There are third party resources I'll show you in a second. But uh, before I go to the next slide, 
sometimes organizations have been able to finesse this situation for the, the older volunteer who can't be depended upon to drive safely simply by putting them in a, into a new role. Uh, they could plan s some activities. If they're a veteran volunteer, they know how things work. They can plan some activities. They can be involved in fundraising efforts. There are lots of different ways to keep a volunteer engaged, even if you don't believe that, they're, that it's appropriate for them to drive any longer. Okay, next. Uh, these are some of the resources that I mentioned that uh, might be helpful to you. Occupational therapists can provide a good third party evaluation of an older driver's ability to drive safely. Um, a complete workup can be done for a few hundred dollars. This is something you might choose to uh, discuss with um, the volunteer's family. It's there, uh, you can find more information on their website. And the Hartford Center also has some great resources. Okay. Next, there we go. Uh, now, I'm, th the next few slides give you an overview of what you can uh, what you can expect if you choose to have your volunteer drivers take this online course that I mentioned that we helped develop. It covers everything from the safety of the vehicle itself, um, the some of the communications issues that we talked about, defensive driving, uh, hazards that can be expected, how, uh, distracted driving is a big issue um, that, that we address in this program. And then if an accident does happen, uh, what you can do, um, how you should respond appropriately. Okay. In addition to the online volunteer driver safety training course, and did I mention that that's free if you're a VIS member? Uh, that's, there's no cost to you or your volunteers, as many as you would like to have trained. It's all complimentary as a member. We also have some resources that have been very popular we call preventer papers. These are documents that are one to two, maybe three pages that are very good for either small group safety training or just to give to individual volunteers themselves. These are based, we developed these based on the actual claims history of our volunteer insurance program. We know the kinds of things that can happen and we have uh, over 50 preventer papers that you can use to help these things from happening in your own organization. Okay. Again, these are, these are some of the things that are, uh, the issues that are addressed in our individual preventer papers and also in the online safety course, some of the most common vehicle accidents. And the next slide. Here are some of the many different ways that drivers can make mistakes. Uh, speeding is one of the biggest ones. Uh, in our insurance program, we see a lot of claims are because of uh, improper turning, not, not having the right of way, turning from the wrong lane and so forth. Next. You see, there are so many common errors, we couldn't even fit them on one slide. Some of the, uh, it's worth mentioning in the third one there, improper backing. We've had accidents and even a fatality that happened in parking lots because volunteers did not understand what was going on around them or they were trying to open a door with the car and drive and they had their foot on the brake and it slipped off. They didn't see what was behind them and backed over someone. These things can happen. So um, it's, it's not only on the highway, it's also before you even get on the highway that these things can happen. Okay, next. Some of you knew uh, Susan Ellis, the late great pioneer in all things related to volunteerism, uh, founder of the Energize Publishing Company. Susan liked to say that 
the fewer differences that you can have between your paid staff and your volunteers, the better off you are. And one of the areas where that really comes into focus is uh, holding volunteers accountable. Just because they're not paid, that doesn't mean that they can't be held responsible for following your procedures and even disciplined uh, up to termination, including termination, if necessary. Uh, your organization's viability and management of risks is much more important than any individual volunteer who ever comes through your door. So uh, that's the priority to keep and to make sure that as long as you put your organization's interest first uh, and you're kind about it, you don't need to worry about accountability for volunteers. Just treat them very much like you would your paid staff. I'm always asked about, well, what about, uh, what if we have a, them sign a waiver that we're not liable if they get hurt or anything? Don't rely on that. They've been struck down many times in court as uh, being too much construed in favor of the organization. So the best thing that waivers do is focus the volunteer's attention on the fact that there are hazards out there and that they need to be careful. Volunteer immunity, both the federal statute and the state statutes that uh, follow it is overrated because it excludes acts of gross negligence. And if you're a good plaintiff's attorney, you can make that term extremely, extremely elastic. And it, anything involving the operation of a motor vehicle. So which is what all of you do with your transportation programs. So don't depend on volunteer immunity statutes to protect you. All right, next. Uh, now quickly before I wrap up my part, just to touch on insurance. Insurance is simply transferring a risk to an insurance company. And the serious risks that you cannot eliminate through your day-to-day -day practices are those that should be insured. Now, with respect to volunteers, it's not a good idea to include volunteers on your general liability policy. Even though they are included automatically in most cases, and it doesn't cost you anything extra. Uh, the reason is, if you include volunteers on your general liability policy, you are sharing your limits of liability with them. So if a volunteer causes an incident, and both the volunteer and your organization are named in a lawsuit, your limits of liability might not be enough to cover both if there's a judgment against you. So that's, um, that's why I will, uh, I will suggest to you that you consider insuring them separately through our program. That way volunteers have a, a benefit that's valuable in recruiting and, re and retaining good volunteers and your organization gets to keep its limits of liability just for you. Okay. Now you can look at these uh, insurance resources at your leisure. Uh, some of them are included in the handouts for this session, the insurance basics. Lots of times we're asked, well, you know, what do we really have to have? Our budget is very tight. What, what, what's, what do we have to have and what could be maybe considered later? And those two documents shown there in the first bullet can help you. If you are interested in insuring your volunteers, that the next two bullets uh, show you where to go. A lot of people know our uh, business administrator, SEMA, uh, more than they know VIS, but we are we work together and VIS uh, provides that makes the insurance available. We're the membership organization and SEMA is the insurance broker that actually administers and provides service for that program. All right, next. Uh, I know if you attended uh, Lana Janot's uh, part one webinar, for, uh, Lana from AARP, there's a lot of discussion about the fact that insurance companies often confuse volunteers with Uber and Lyft drivers. And there's been a problem with volunteers not being absolutely certain that their personal auto insurance would cover them 
if they had an act, if they caused an accident while volunteering. VIS is doing what we can to make sure that the insurance industry understands that there is a gaping difference between uh, ride hailing drivers such as Uber drivers and volunteers. The uh, Helen Kirshner and I co-authored an op-ed piece which was published a couple of weeks ago in the Journal of the Independent Insurance Agents and Brokers of America trying to get agents to understand the difference and the fact that uh, the blurring of this issue with insurance companies is causing a big problem with drivers not being willing in many cases to to volunteer for nonprofits because they're concerned about their liability. So we will continue to do what we can on the insurance industry side to correct this problem. There's a little bit of a movement with state legislatures Mm -hmm. to force insurance companies to recognize the difference and not penalize volunteer drivers just because they use their personal vehicles sometimes in that role. Um, Next. This is how you can reach me, either uh, email or by phone, uh, with any questions that come up or any other assistance, guidance that you might need. I'm happy to talk with you anytime. It's been a great pleasure to be with you today. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague, Carrie. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, William, very much. Um, Again, I'm Carrie Diamond. Uh, Virginia had a Very nice introduction, so we'll get right in it um, to kind of continue on the next slide. Um, When I was with the Greater Wisconsin Agency on Aging, I did a survey of uh, volunteer driver programs around the state. And one of the reasons I did this is because there isn't a consistent area, one place where volunteer drivers report to. They operate with a patchwork of funding, federal, state, local funding, Um, bake sales and brat fries. Um, And so there wasn't really one place to really understand the amount and the the impact of volunteer drivers in the state of Wisconsin. So the survey was conducted, uh, web searches, phone interviews, and we found over 60 volunteer driver programs in the state with over uh, 2,600 drivers. And these programs Um, They covered just about every county in the state um, and had anywhere from two or three volunteers to three or 400 volunteers, depending on where in the state they operated. We asked a lot of things and and one of the things I found interesting was that 92% of the volunteer driver programs provided reimbursement, some sort of reimbursement for volunteers driving their own vehicles. Um, But in regards to what uh, William was just talking about, about a third of the programs had uh, volunteers who experienced personal vehicle insurance issues in the past year. So it was pretty significant when you um, consider how many programs um, that that had impacted. Uh, Next slide, please. And while there were, will continue to be systemic barriers like state insurance laws, federal charitable driving reimbursement rate, there is a lot of there are a lot of things that can be done on the programmatic level to minimize risks and issues in the future. And William went through um, several of these. And what I'll do is get a little more into the weeds and how you put that into practice into your policies, into your job descriptions. Um, one of the things that Um, I did want to bring up right away is that volunteer driver staff and management really need to balance your risk management practices with a recognition that you are working with volunteers. Um, In this picture is somebody balancing uh, rocks on a beach, uh, balancing weighing the benefits and the costs of your program and not making it too onerous for your volunteers. A regular review of your um, A periodic review of your policies and procedures can help eliminate issues. I know when I operated a volunteer driver program, um, we would sometimes figure out we needed a change if we had an incident. And it's really better to get ahead of that 
And so I'm going to go through on the next slides um, some of the risk management best practices for you to think about. And as you're reviewing your, your program or if you're implementing a new program, things to consider. Next slide, please. So um, these are the things that I'm going to go through today. Your job description, which is a really good introductory piece where you can put your requirements, and that's your first kind of uh, vetting of the volunteer, screening and onboarding, training, policies and procedures, and then finally monitoring and evaluating your program. Um, next slide, please. And if you want to launch the poll, so um, Heather's going to have a poll up for you shortly. And if we can quickly respond to this. I want to know if you have a job description for your volunteer driver. And the answer is yes, no, unsure. If you don't have a program, you can click unsure or just not respond. I'm just curious to see how, um, how programs are dealing with volunteer drivers in this regard. So we'll leave it open a couple more seconds if you can respond. And then uh, close it out anytime, Heather. Great. So it looks like 65% of you who have volunteer, um, who are on this, have job descriptions for your volunteer drivers. So that's excellent. Um, next slide, please. Some of the things that if you have a job description, you want to review and make sure you have there. And if you don't have a job description, might be some things to consider as you're uh, putting one together. Certainly the job title and even there, is it volunteer driver? Is it community driver? Is it a chauffeur, so chauffeur or is it just a volunteer? Um, the job summary, make it attention grabbing. This could be the first time somebody is being introduced to your program. So put your mission and your expectations. Why should they volunteer for you? And then a really critical point to the job description are roles and responsibilities. So do you have a certain age, an age minimum somebody has to be to drive? Do they have to have their license a certain number of years? Um, do they have to have certain physical ability to drive um, or to assist folks? And this is where we actually went back um, and augmented our job description to kind of be something we could point back to if somebody was getting to the point where we weren't sure they were safe. So we had things like must be able to drive safely or without accidents and things like that to really beef up um, the roles and responsibilities that we could look back and and bring to the driver and say, maybe you're not able to do these roles and responsibilities anymore. Certainly schedule and commitment that they would be um, committing to for your organization. Um, qualifications and skills, and this is hard skills like safe driving and soft skills, communication, training and supervision that they will receive, and then the benefits they'll get, both in terms of mileage reimbursement, if that is something that your agency offers, but also you know, the giving back to the community and interactions with people and connections with people are all benefits that you could put in this job description. Next slide. And then uh, William talked about many of the screenings and I'll just point out a couple of things. Um, with background checks, you do have the criminal background check, but some people also run things like a caregiver check. Your volunteers are often unsupervised with somebody who's a vulnerable adult. And so caregiver background checks get into people who may have been, um, uh, have some abuse, um, maybe have been in a helping position before, and have a record of abuse for those individuals. And that's what a care, caregiver background check uh, can involve. So something else to look at. I absolutely agree with William, the DMV checks having a service. I know in Wisconsin, it's through our DOT, our Department of Transportation, but there may be others that provide this that will alert you if somebody loses their license because it's way better to pay for that small fee uh, to learn that somebody doesn't have a license than to have them get in an accident or incident and not have a license. Reference, reference checks are great to do um, because that sometimes self-selects people. They um, won't give you reference checks and so they don't become a volunteer and maybe you wouldn't have wanted that person anyway if they can't give you a good reference. 
um, some sort of driving test, driving along with somebody, and then medical clearance. And this is, this is something that a lot of people talk about. So will you require drug testing? Um, will they have to have a medical clearance to drive? Or is that only after an incident or surgery? I know we had an incident where a driver had a heart attack. In order to come back to drive from us, we required some sort of note from a physician saying that that person was able to do that. And now we have some COVID considerations. So um, has there been a close contact? Um, did they have COVID and now they're coming back? How are you gonna handle that with your screening? Next slide. So there's a lot of things as you're onboarding somebody. Um, and I'd suggest that you have some sort of checklist. Is all the paperwork signed? Have you, do you have permission to do all of the background checks that you wanna do? Have you done reference checks? Um, did you drive along with the driver or know that they are fit to drive? Next slide. Um, has the vehicle been inspected by you um, to make sure that, or by somebody, um, that it is safe, that it has heat if you should need it and AC if you should need it? Um, some volunteer driver programs um, make, make volunteers go through the AARP car fit assessment, um, which makes sure that the, the mirrors are adjusted properly and that the volunteer fits in the car. And so that's um, a good uh, assessment to have done. And then all of the trainings. So have they been oriented to your agency? Do they know how to do emergency reporting and procedures? And have they had that to start um, before they started on their assignment? So that brings us to our second and final poll. It has two questions. Um, so if you could launch that, uh, Heather. The first question is, do you provide training for your volunteer drivers before they start? Yes or no, and if you don't have a program, just don't answer. And then subsequently, do you provide ongoing training for your volunteers, yes or no? So if you can answer both of those questions, then we'll take a look at who provides uh, initial training and who provides ongoing training. So we'll leave that for just a couple more seconds um, and then go ahead and close that whenever you see. Great, so um, this is what I suspected. A vast majority of you do provide training before people start. Less of you provide ongoing training for your volunteer drivers. And that's something that you may want to take a look at, how you can provide additional training to your volunteers, um, whether it's in writing or an online course like William had mentioned. Um, next slide. And while there are a few courses that, that you can take, there's also a lot of resources um, in several of these areas. And these are some broad areas that I would suggest you do training for, including um, road and vehicle safety, which can include things like roundabouts, defensive driving, bad weather driving, distracted driving, uh, passenger safety, which can include some first aid or emergency procedures, bloodborne pathogens, red flags or gateway training. So how do I identify maybe somebody um, it, it is deteriorating in their health or you suspect abuse or some other situation and how to handle that? And then passenger assistance and sensitivity, including ethics and boundaries customer service, disability etiquette, things that your drivers are gonna to wanna to know. Um, we had an instance when I ran a program of somebody who had uh, epilepsy. They did not want it disclosed to the driver that they had epilepsy, but we wanted to ensure that drivers were able to handle should that person have a seizure while they were in the vehicle. So what we did was we implemented a training on dealing with uh, epileptic seizures uh, for our whole staff. That way we gave them the tools to respond to that without um, pointing out who the rider was that um, had that um, condition. And then with all training programs, make sure it's vetted through your internal risk management department or your corporation council. Um, and to make sure that you, you hit everything that's needed according to your agency. Uh, next slide, please. 
And then finally, policies and procedures. And it's good to have some sort of handbook for both the passengers and for the drivers. And things can be covered. There might be similar things like how to deal with cancellations, but there would be differences in how would a rider schedule a ride? How would a driver accept a ride? Um, what are the, the situation for donations or fares? Can you provide tips? Is there mileage reimbursement? How would a driver report their mileage? Um, a bill of rights for both the passenger and the driver, things like you have the right to be treated with respect. You have the right for the rider to treat your vehicle with respect and abide by your rules in the vehicle, whether it's no eating or things like that. Um, along with that, a code of conduct for both the driver and the rider. And this is really good even to get signed that they've received this because if somebody, uh, if you have an abusive rider, um, then you have this to go back to. Um, certainly having a complaint complement, always make sure you give people an opportunity to provide compliments as well as a grievance process. Next slide, please. And then also things like seatbelt requirements. If, if that's in the handbook, then the driver can just point to that and say, no, it's required by our program. And it kind of takes that onus off them. Certainly confidentiality is a big, big thing. Um, incident and accident procedures, weather procedures. Um, we had to put in some guidance on dealing with personal oxygen tanks because we trans had uh, several riders who had oxygen tanks and they can be pretty dangerous projectiles in a crash. And so how to properly secure those and we provided that training. Um, and then now we have to consider infectious diseases in COVID. When maybe you'll provide an addendum to your policies and procedures, something that indicates when somebody can come back to riding, should they have had an exposure or had the condition, um, and just new things to consider. Um, and that's why a periodic review of your policies and procedures is really great. Next slide. And always include the right to refuse. So whether a driver or a rider, if, fail, if they fail to follow those safety procedures and what's laid out, for the program, they may not be able to drive for you anymore, or they may not be able to ride within your program. Next slide. And then finally, monitoring and evaluation. So make sure you have regular reviews of your program. Um, reviews of the driver, are they still safe? Are they still abiding by um, your requirements and your safety policies? Um, again, the the complaint and grievance process. Um, a lot of times it's a he said, he said, she said, where the rider says something and the driver says something else. So you want to make sure you have a process in place to make sure those are fully vetted, that you're not just discounting one um, somebody's word over the other. Driver suspension termination process, including how they are welcomed back into the program if they are, whether that's behavior related, health condition related, um, or, and William talked about this, if they are aging out of that volunteer opportunity, um, their safety as a driver um, for you is in question. And so really having that built into your process from the start, maybe making times where people can check in to re-up to volunteer. Often volunteer driver becomes the, um, the volunteer position in eternity because people just continue on until they don't. Well, having an, a re-up for that volunteer opportunity might give people a really natural opportunity to say, nope, I'm just not gonna do it anymore, which can help people self-select out of the program. But then also having uh, uh, some things in place on how you're going to deal with people who just aren't safe drivers any, anymore. And one of those alternatives is that William uh, suggested was providing an alternate volunteer job for that, per that person to provide. Um, you may even consider exit interviews as well, whether the person is just leaving because they don't wanna drive anymore, whether they are deemed unsafe to drive anymore, making sure you touch, uh, touch base with them and, and ensure that um, you're doing what you can to support the volunteers that you have. Next slide. And then finally, uh, the benefits of risk management, certainly number one, it protects your agency. 
protects your volunteers, and it protects your riders. You really want to make sure that those things are in place to, to, um, to counter kind of those liability. Volunteer driver programs, often people say they're really risky, but overall, I managed a program for five years and we had zero incidents um, within that five years. We generally have really safe, conscientious drivers. So the risk management you put in place is really a protection for everybody involved. But it also provides tools to help your volunteers be successful in their role. It shows that you value your volunteers by investing in training and investing in policies and making sure that they're prepared. And it provides opportunities for feedback for you. Things that, you know, a lot of times these are volunteers you may not see on a regular basis. Things that happen between your communication, um, things that happen out in the field that you may not know about, and providing those opportunities will help improve your program and improve your risk management policies going forward. The last slide, and I know that you'll, um, you'll have access to these slides, are some additional resources um, from the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center. So there's a toolkit there that you can look at. The National Center for Mobility Management also has some resources on volunteer drivers. Um, I referred to the Greater Wisconsin Agency on Aging Resources, who I used to work for, but that's where the, the survey results and some other resources are there. Um, the National Volunteer Transportation Center has some resources, as well as the National Volunteer Caregiver Network. While not all caregiver programs provide transportation, a good number of the members in that network do, and so they have several resources as well. And then that's my next slide is my final slide with my contact information should you want to get in touch with me, and then we'll turn it over to um, Virginia to moderate the questions. Thank you, Carrie and William. Um, I think you both have uh, given us lots of really, really valuable information. And just underscoring the fact that um, in the years that we have uh, operated the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center, um, it never fails to amaze me that volunteer transportation, uh, questions and issues and concerns continues uh, to be a very high priority for programs um, around the country that are uh, working to better address the transportation needs of older adults and people with disabilities. So um, thank you both for adding to our knowledge. Um, the handouts and the slides will be available uh, following this presentation, uh, along with an evaluation that you will be sent. Um, so uh, we, we really encourage you to fill out that evaluation. And also it's a way of letting us know what else about volunteer transportation um, is really high on your radar screen, things that really need to be addressed. Um, so let's start. Um, first question we have is um, for William, um, wondering about the addresser link for the online safety course. Um, this person, uh, Kristen Kendall, says that she's had trouble recently accessing it. Um, so, um, uh, Kristen, if you could provide your email address um, in the chat, um, then uh, and direct that to uh, NADTC, um, then I'm sure we can get the address from William. Uh, William, do you want to? add to that or have there been some issues with that particular site? Uh, there were some issues a few months ago. I'm not aware of, of any recently. National Volunteer Transportation Center.org should get you there. Uh, if you are a member of VIZ, we have a shortcut to it. Um, you can join VIZ, by the way, for $25 a year on the website. And there, um, once you do that, there's a gateway to not only that training program, but also the Viz Vault of all of our preventer papers and other risk management resources. So one of those two should get you there, but you know, if not, uh, please email me and I'll try to figure it out. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, William. And, and William's contact information, of course, is included on the slide. Um, so next question. 
Um, how can governmental agencies such as municipalities ensure volunteer drivers and uh, connected to that, do government agencies need to partner with a nonprofit to be able to offer volunteer insurance? <sighs> A governmental, we, we do ensure the volunteers of a number, excuse me, a number of uh, city and county and regional governments. Uh, they uh, access our program the same way as a nonprofit would. Many local governments are self insured, but still they choose to purchase commercial policies for one purpose or another. And we do have a number of them that purchase our volunteer insurance for the people who volunteer, whether it's in transportation, some kind of social services, parks and recreation, conservation, whatever it might be. So they, they apply and access the program the same as a nonprofit would. And I'll add that when I worked for the Aging and Disability Resource Center, we were a county entity and we ensured, we had the overall umbrella policy through the county, but we ensured all of our volunteers, not just our volunteer drivers, um, through SEMA um, as well with that added protection. It's a really reasonable per, um, per volunteer cost. Um, th thanks to both of you. Um, so the question uh, it has been asked, does the NADTC have a guidebook for how to start a volunteer driver program? I know that Carrie in the, in the resources that she cited included a toolkit um, on volunteer transportation. There are quite a number of resources on our website. Um, William and Carrie both mentioned the Volunteer Transportation Center as an excellent source of information. And you've got, with the slides, you have the address um, to get access to that as well as a number of other organizations. So Carrie and William, anything else to add to what I just said? I will just add that um, feel free to reach out to other volunteer driver programs. That's what I did to, you know, copy templates and um, get resources that they have. I know Washington State had a really good kind of um, uh, handbook on how to start a volunteer driver program. And I think there's others that are kind of in the works, but um, there are a lot of resources out there. Um, start with some of the, the resources that I had on that uh, last slide for how to begin. And some of you know Dr. Helen Kirshner, who way back was uh, head of the Beverly Foundation, then she became executive director of the National Volunteer Transportation Center. Helen is now with the Shepherd Centers of America, and uh, she probably knows as, as much as anyone about volunteer-based transportation programs. So you could contact Helen through the Shepherd Centers of America. Um, and William, I'm gonna ask you to send me uh, Helen's contact information so that when we do the follow-up and include the handouts to everybody, that we can also include contact information for Helen. And uh, you're absolutely right. Helen is an absolute um, uh, sure. tremendous important resource on anything having to do with volunteer transportation. Um, next question is for Carrie. Um, can you explain what a caregiver uh, background check is? Sure, so I know these differ in, in different states. And so I'll talk to uh, Wisconsin um, is it was an additional check. Um, it also costs some more, but it was through, I believe our Bureau of Quality Assurance and is really meant for helping um, professions like CNAs, um, other kind of nursing people that if somebody had an incident um, where, where they were abusive or um, had a complaint again, against um, them by somebody they were caring for, it would show up on that caregiver background check. So we did that as a best practice um, to ensure that you know, we were protecting those who were most vulnerable. Some of those offenses were, did, do not show up on the criminal uh, uh, background checks just because of the, their nature. Maybe there weren't criminal charges that were filed, variety of things. Um, we also had uh, contracts with our managed care organization and they did require that extra check as well. 
Thanks. Um, so are there sample policies and procedures published somewhere? This sounds like a very helpful tool and I couldn't agree more. I think it would be helpful. Um, carry a William, I don't think they are anywhere in particular. Well, I'll say that I did compile, the reason I have the, the GUAR website on there is that uh, when I was there, I did get some samples and they're still up on the website. I did check today. Um, and so there, there are some samples that you can find on that website that you can model after. And William, anything to add? I don't believe I have anything to add to that. Virginia. Okay, I, I will say that one of the things that Carrie said that I think is really important to remember, um, if actually everything she said is important to remember, but, um, but the, the statement about uh, getting in touch with other volunteer um, uh, programs. And this, this is not rocket science. It is a question of picking and choosing. So getting in touch with a couple or three volunteer uh, transportation programs and kind of borrowing what they are using, um, picking and choosing what you think is most important for your particular uh, circumstances and program, um, I think is, is very good advice uh, to anyone who is embarking on this work. And frankly, I think just staying in touch with others who do this work is really important as well. Um, I did think that, of you in Virginia that there's a Facebook group, I believe it's called Your Thriving Nonprofit, where there's a lot of good uh, suggestions. People have questions, how do I do this or that? And a lot of very strong programs provide answers. So that's another resource I would suggest. I believe it's called Your Thriving Nonprofit on Facebook. Thriving? Thriving. I, I'm going to ask you to send that to me as well. So okay. we'll we'll add to the, these resources and make sure that folks have them at the end at the end of this at the end of this meeting. And um, I will I'll add that if you aren't familiar with any uh, programs right now, we I you happy to contact me and we can help connect you to other volunteer driver programs. Uh, thank thank you, Carrie. Um, the, the question was asked about the first session, if that's still available. I think Heather, at the beginning of this call, mentioned the fact that, that the recording as well as the PowerPoint is available on our website. Um, and when we send the evaluation, we'll be sure that you have the link um, to that as well. So what should be, um, and this is a really thoughtful question, what should be our main risk concerns given COVID? I, either one of you can walk in here and see what, um, try to answer that question. Gary, I heard you mention COVID in your presentation. Do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, I know there's been some discussion about, you know, do we have a waiver of sorts and William cautioned that waivers aren't, you know, bulletproof. Um, but ensuring, I think ensuring that your volunteers and the riders know the risks that, you know, despite one, what have you done to, to make your operations safer? And then two, despite that, by volunteering for you, there still is a risk of contracting um, COVID um, and making sure that they're aware of that and that they opt in um, to the program the way it is now. So. Um, really having that communication with your drivers, making sure they're comfortable, I think is a big thing um, going forward. And, and I'll just jump in here. One of the things that we have certainly heard um, since um, the beginning of, of the pandemic is that some volunteer programs have had to suspend service or greatly reduce the services that they're providing because so many of their drivers are older themselves and at high risk of COVID um, and are quarantining. Um, and I do know of one program, the Northern Virginia um, volunteer um, driver program that uh, made a particular effort to recruit some younger drivers um, to help fill the gaps because they were still getting requests for rides, of course. Um, so we've got two more questions and I know we're right at the top of the hour, but I'm gonna to try to 
if you all will bear with us, uh, we'll try to get through them. Um, for a long time, we had a separate policy for hired and non-owned auto policy for a hired and non-owned auto policy, along with our gentle, general liability policy. It was dropped by our provider. Do we need it? Yeah, the hired and non-owned. So auto. it's a, a long time we had a separate policy for quote, hired and non-owned auto policy. Apparently this is a program that was using um, either rental vehicles or, or they were vehicles that were not owned by the program, I suppose, um, along with a gen general liability policy. And it was dropped by the provider of insurance, apparently. Do we still need something like that? Yes. The non-owned and hired auto policy protects the organization if, for example, an employee or a volunteer is using a vehicle that the employee owns or the volunteer owns, or maybe a rental car and causes an accident and the organization is sued. The organization is protected by the non-owned and hired. It's, I know in insurance, some of the terms are very clunky and archaic, but that's what it means. It means the organization does not own the vehicles that either their employees or their volunteers were driving that caused the accident. It's very fundamental. And I don't know who the insurance carrier is in this situation, but it is still available. And usually as a companion to the general liability policy. And if uh, whoever asked the question, if you want to contact me, I will refer it to SEMA, which is a full service property and casualty insurance broker to find you an insurance company that will offer the non-owned and hired auto. Now you'll have to switch your general liability policy to them. They won't write just the non-owned policy. But, Thanks, uh, William. That, that's, yeah. that's very helpful. Um, so how much money do you need to start a volunteer program? <laughs> you do need money. I think mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's a well-known fact that volunteers are not free. Um, even when you don't reimburse for mileage. And I think it's really hard to say how much you need. Um, uh, to start with, I would say you, you need enough um, to, to begin your program to ensure that you have the staff capacity uh, to do recruitment and oversight and training for an initial group of volunteers. Um, and you have the ability to connect with others who can provide guidance on where this volunteer program can fit into the rest of the transportation in your community. Um, we've got one more question and uh, Carrie or, or William, did you wanna add anything to that money question? Big can of worms, I would say. Uh, it really, uh, some of these programs operate on a prayer and a song, as I think we all know. Others are extremely well-funded um, and I'd say most of them are somewhere in the middle of those two extremes. Um, what comes to mind very quickly, Virginia, is the, the growth and success of the village to village network. Ah. You might, might be aware of, I think there are close to 200 programs in operation around the country now. Volunteers provide transportation and other services for, for clients, but there is a, a membership fee that the client pays for those services. So that provides a little bit of a funding basis. Okay. Um, and William, returning to that question about automobile um, owned and hired and non-owned automobile insurance, uh, regardless of having the non-owned and hired, the volunteer's personal auto will be primary. Is that correct? The, that's, to protect that's the volunteer, yes. Yeah, it will not absolutely. protect the organization. The organization is protected by the non-owned and hired policy. Thank you. Thank you. That's an important clarification. So this is our final question. If you have Virginia. additional questions, you can certainly include those when you fill out the evaluation. Um, guidance to handle when there's not a good match between driver and client. 
such as personality differences or overreaching requests by the client? Um, also, is there an alternative to the driver giving the client their phone number so they don't get on, so they don't get ongoing calls? Um, I'll, so, I'll jump. Yep, I'll jump in here and say this is where having the, that policy and guidance and handbook is really handy that you can point back to if they are inappropriately contacting the driver, then you can reach, go back to your handbook and say, this is not appropriate. You could lose your um, ability to use our program. Um, and then the good match between driver and client, that's the communication. So check in with your, your drivers. Do you have a new rider or a new driver? Check in with some of your existing riders to see how things are going. So um, that's the communication and making sure that both your riders and your drivers feel comfortable to call you with some of those, um, those type of, of situations when they come up. Wonderful. Um, so last words, William and Carrie, uh, because we're five minutes after the hour and I wanna be respectful of people's schedules. Anything else to add? Well, my I final word say is, I admire every one of you who's in this webinar trying to gain new information and I admire you for doing what you can to uh, support your mission. Yeah. And, and beyond, I, go ahead, Carrie. <laughs> just um, volunteer drivers are really important. Um, there are challenges, um, but the, what they offer aside from a ride is just so important. They are not free and they, we do need assistance in helping to um, make sure that you know, regulations are clear, insurance is clear, charitable driving reimbursement rates are you know, adequate, that um, continue to do what you do and let's, let's, as a volunteer driver network all together, uh, push forward for these really valuable programs. And I just wanna add my uh, thanks. Um, to all of you, uh, certainly, but especially to William and Carrie uh, for sharing their considerable expertise this afternoon. Uh, we will be in touch with handouts as well as an evaluation and the opportunity to, to tell us here at the NADTC um, whether there are, are additional topics or subtopics on volunteer transportation that you'd like us uh, to put a webinar together on. Um, and uh, all of you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.